we're facing the fact that we've done cost-benefit analysis and looked only at the benefits, not looked at the cost. The whole carbon bubble, the carbon moment in human history is one great big gaspillage of a resource with no cost accounted for in terms of its impact on a global functioning ecosystem. If those costs were internalized, you'd be paying $57 a gallon for gas, right? So yeah, we got to get the metrics straight, but we also just have to move off of carbon. Not because it's becoming more scarce. A few years ago, we used to think, and I, on one of the graphs I used, it was the peak oil question that was the great anxiety. We're going to run out of the stuff. Well, in fact, we're not going to run out of fossil fuels in any known future, especially with the new technologies used in fracking and the like. It's not the scarcity of the material, it's the impact of the material. We can't survive using that amount of carbon. Just on the, on the post-Columbian city basis, post-Columbian cities are those that were put in place after Columbus discovered, as it were, the new world. Uh, he didn't discover it because it wasn't lost, right? But in any case, the post-Columbian city was put in place, pretty much, at sea level. Because that's how he got here, right? On a boat. The post-Columbian city is under challenge. If you didn't see the graphic here, 1,400 cities in the United States alone. We can't survive in those cities with the combustion of terrestrial carbon. This is why the new movement that's emerging is called the carbon underground. We're trying to keep the carbon underground. And you start doing the metric for that, you measure progress in a very different way. Not how much carbon have you used, but how much have you sequestered? How much have you prevented from being used? Second point about other alternative energies, use the renewable ones. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that nuclear is a solution to anything. If you want to look at externalized costs, think about the tens of thousands of years of the waste products that you have to deal with. We don't even have human languages that have persisted long enough to label the stuff. Right? There used to be a department within the DOD, the Department of Defense in the United States, which has to kind of think of symbol systems to put on nuclear waste dumps so that people would know after a nuclear exchange had occurred to stay away from this material because it was lethal, because the languages wouldn't be around anymore. Right? We can't cope with the downstream impact of nuclear, let alone the downstream impact of carbon. So don't think nuclear is the solution to this. What you've got to do is, is run the whole thing on the solar throughput. Now that means water, wind, tidal, um, micro, hydro, and the like. That is, hy hydro is a function of the water cycle, and you're placing yourself back into a solar-driven system. But the, the only, see, we've got the thing 180 degrees around. We think we live on a planet with infinite resources and finite energy. We're struggling over to control that finite energy. In fact, in America, it's so absurd. We think that the world doesn't quite get it. That's our oil in the Middle East, right? It's just a geologic mistake it's in the Middle East. Um, but it's our oil. And we spend a few billion dollars a day sort of making sure the world understands that. It's our oil. We're on the wrong metaphor in the sense that it's not infinite energy that we have moved to and we need to. The infinite throughput of solar energy. We're thinking we've got finite energy and infinite resources, whereas in fact we have finite resources and infinite energy. So this isn't just a slight correction in metric here and there. It's a compass question. Are we going in the right direction? not are we becoming more efficient in the direction in which we're going. Uh, all you'll do with that is sort of make extinction more efficient, which really isn't the goal. Thank you very much.